All right, so in this video, I'm going to talk about uh, Edgeworth bucks, but no, 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 let's cut this. Okay, so in this video, I'm going to talk about a review of consumer theory. You may wonder what the heck. Uh, well, it's very important. It's, I think, in my opinion, is one of the reasons why a lot of students are having difficulties. So I think in intermediate microeconomics, this chapter and you know, the, uh, the, 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 the version with uh, pr production is the most challenging chapter of this course. All right. One of the reasons, I believe, is that it requires a lot of information that you should remember from the, uh, the Intermediate Microeconomics uh, 1 course. Um, so for that reason, I wanted to make a very short review, uh, which we will use a lot later, especially when we talk about Predo efficient allocation, Predo set contract curve, and Walras in equilibrium. All right. So this review hopefully is going to be shorter than 10 or 15 minutes. So what matters is the following. If you remember, um, we come up with um, an agent, I mean single agent, all right, a agent A, let's say, well, we don't really need to name an agent. The agent has a utility function, all right. There are two goods, x1 and x2. So instead of superscript, I put it on a, as, a, as a subscript because I don't name agent. So it's not XA1, XA2, it's just X1 and X2. So the agent has a utility function, two goods, all right? Um, so this is the standard consumer theory. This is how we start to a model. Agent with the utility function, uh, there are two goods for simplicity. We can consider the case where there are multiple, you know, five goods but two is good enough. There, you know, prices, the prices are positive, obviously, nothing is free. And then the person has an income, M, which is the amount of money the consumer comes to this problem. And so the question we ask, what is the optimal amount of good one and good two, uh, the demand for good one and good two, which will maximize the agent's utility. This is how we find the uh, optimal demand, remember. So the problem, the mathematical optimization problem, is maximize the utility function of this agent by choosing what? The, the choice variables are x1 and x2, all right? So they're going to be some, um, you know, non-negative um, numbers. Um, so let's, well, mostly positive, but let's put R plus. Um, so the, the, the problem is to maximize the utility function uh, by choosing X1 and X2, obviously subject to, right? Uh, well, this is a constraint optimization because X1 and X2, well, the utility function is usually increasing. An example, e.g. is u of x1 x2 equals square root of x1 times x2 all right something like this well the thing is um, as you increase x1 and x2 well the utility will increase so therefore x1 and x2 infinite is like the point that will maximize the utility function but the thing is the guy doesn't have that much money all right so if you try to buy infinite amount of good one or good two it's going to exceed his budget so the problem is therefore to maximize this utility function subject to the budget constraint the idea of budget constraint which is critical because we're going to use that later is the expenditure should be less than and i mean it should be equal to the income what is the expenditure well if the price of good one is p1 per good one and if you're buying x1 many good one well the total expenditure the total amount of money you're going to spend on good one is p1 times x1 right and p2 x2 is the total expenditure on good two this should be exactly equal to your income it shouldn't be less than that because your utility is increasing so you shouldn't save i mean here there is no saving in this model again for simplicity and so if it is less than m it means you're wasting your money but you shouldn't waste all right so the uh, it should be exactly equal to m so that's the mathematical problem. So how do we solve it is simple. We usually write the Lagrangian to solve it, or we just 
write x1 as a function of x2 and whenever we see x2 we just plug it here in the utility function all right so instead of x1 times x2 square root it's going to become basically x1 times m minus p2 x2 divided by p1 because this is what x1 is right if you send everything to the right hand side and divide both sides by p1 this is what you're going to get so uh well plug this here so what you're going to ha have is a the utility is a function of x2 only which is the square root of m minus p2 x2 divided by p1 times x2 all right and then the first order condition basically del u del x2 equals zero and solve for x2 that's gonna bring us the optimal x2 obviously it's going to depend on p1 p2 and m and once you find this plug it back here to find the optimal demand for a good one all right so that's how we find the optimal demand okay um we will use all that when i talk about walras in equilibrium you'll see uh, the graphically what we do if you remember we will also use that graphical representation again later and so it's also important so graphically we draw the budget curve we put x1 on the horizontal axis x2 on the vertical axis remember so that's the zero zero point okay um, and then we have the budget curve the budget curve is basically this uh, p1 x1 plus p2 x2 equals m so it's the horizontal intercept is always m divided by p1 the vertical intercept is always m over p2 all right and therefore the budget curve is going to be this which has a slope minus obviously uh, p1 over p2 I mean this portion divided by this portion so minus so it's going to be minus p1 over p2 well then um, what about the utility function well the utility function we cannot draw it on x1 x2 dimension in order to draw x1 to this utility function you need something like oh x1 um, x2 and then the third dimension u of x1 x2 so this is how we draw a two-dimensional uh, two a function with two variables but the thing is um, you know it's very complex uh, to sort of visualize I mean hard to visualize three-dimensional graph so what we do we we draw the level sets we don't call it level sets in economics we call it indifference curves indifference curves if you remember so how do we find the indifference curves uh, you take your utility function set it equal to some constant some positive constant obviously right for example 10 right so set that equal to 10 well so this constant is completely arbitrary right um, so then find some points x1 and x2 uh, where whenever they multiply it and take it the square roots has to be equal to 10 well you don't have to find come up with all the x1 and x2 values I'm just going to draw that function that that curve uh, but the thing is I I can just find you know three four points and then therefore figure out what the uh, indifference curve will look like so for this very specific example for instance x1 equals 100 x2 equals 1 is going to satisfy this equality right so for example x1 equals 100 x2 equals 1 is somewhere like this and and then symmetrically x2 equals 100 and then x1 equals 1 uh, will again give me the square root is 10 so somewhere like this uh, so is it a straight line parallel to the no for that reason find one more point for example x1 equal x2 equals 10 right so the multiply then take the square root it's going to give me 10 again so 10 10 so this is 1 and 1 so this is say 10 10 all right so what I understand from this is like it's going to look something like this all right oh well in fact if you remember this is a standard Cobb Douglas utility function the x1 to the power 1 half x2 to the power 1 half they always have this nice shape and so this is when at the indifference curve when k is 10 but you can increase it say 20 30 etc or you can decrease it so as you did so therefore all I know is that okay 
So all I know is that as we move in this direction, uh, utility increases. Utility increases. That's what we know. And then finally, this mathematical problem, maximize utility subject to this constraint, means, well, you have to find the point, the highest indifference curve, uh, where um, this, one of the, at least one of the points on this indifference curve is going to be um, satisfying this budget constraint. So for example, this indifference curve certainly has lots of points where uh, our uh, budget uh, you know, constraint is satisfied. But the thing is, we have a higher utility, right? Those points, they, they give higher utility because they're um, lying on a higher indifference curve. And as you basically move in this direction, basically we come up with this point where the indifference curve is tangent to the budget curve, all right? And then we say, oh, uh, the indifference curves, the tangent to the, oops, I'm sorry, I'm terrible with drawing. So the indifference curve is tangent to the budget set means the slope of the budget curve has to be equal to slope of the indifference curve, all right? And so the slope of the indifference, uh, slope of the budget curve is simple. It's minus P1 over P2. What about the slope of the indifference curve? If you remember from intermediate microeconomics, slope of the indifference curve is what we call marginal rate of substitution, right? So the marginal rate of substitution is what? It's basically uh, minus marginal utility of good one, marginal utility of good two, and then what's marginal utility of good one? It's um, the partial derivative with respect to good one, and then partial derivative with respect to good two. All right. So therefore, the, these cancels will. I'm sorry. These minuses will cancel out. So what we have is that the price ratio equal to the ratio of the marginal utilities is what we. Uh, must satisfy for this optimal demand. So this price ratio equal to uh, a marginal utility ratio is going to give us a relationship between x1 and x2. And then uh, we use this constraint. And so we have two equations, two unknowns, and then we can solve for optimal x1 and optimal x2. Uh, which I'm not, well, we can solve for this example. So for this very example, this is the utility function, if you remember. So minus P1 over P2 equal to the marginal, so minus marginal utility with respect to good one. So it's basically one half, X1 to the power of minus one half, because the X1 to the power of one half minus one minus one half times x2 to the power of one half. So this is marginal utility with respect to good one. And the marginal utility with respect to good two is this. So if you just simplify this, the one halves will cancel out. So x1 minus one half, I can send it to denominator. And so it's gonna have x1 one half times x1 one half. So it's gonna be x1 to the power of one. All right, so therefore this. And I can symmetrically send x2 to uh, up, and so it's, it's going to be just x2. So those cancels, the minuses. All I have is p1 divided by p2 equals, therefore, x2 divided by x1. All right? Hence, p1 x1 equals p2 x2. This is what I meant by um, this condition is going to give me a relationship between x1 and x2. And then uh, use the budget constraint. So p1 x1 plus p2x2 equals m. Well, all I know is p2x2 is equal to p1x1. So therefore, this is p1x1 itself. So I have 2p1x1 equal m, hence x1. I'm trying to find x1, remember? So send everything to the other side, meaning divide both sides by 2p1. So x1 is going to be m divided by 2p1. And therefore, um, if you plug this x1 here, so this p1, this p1 will cancel out, therefore x2 is going to be m divided by 2p2. All right, so this is how we find the optimal demand for good 1 and good 2, um, graphically, or by just applying this. If you, if you do this approach, 
you have to get exactly, I mean, you will get exactly the same solution. If you're not getting, that means you're making a, a, a calculation error. So this is sort of a very quick review on consumer theory. On the next video, I'm going to talk about the Edgeworth bucks. All right.